Okay, if you'll bow your heads. Our Heavenly Father, our great Almighty God, we thank you so much for the beautiful world that you have created. We thank you for the calling that you have given to us. We thank you for life itself. We have so much to anticipate as your, your plan slowly but surely unfolds. And we see things around us building to some type of crescendo. So we do pray for your blessing, your angels to be around your people who are scattered all over this entire world. Father, we thank you so much again for the church. We thank you for the United Church of God. We pray that you will bless us with continued peace and prosperity as far as in performing your will and preaching your gospel. And now, Father, we also thank you for your word. As always, it is a tremendous lamp for our path, our walk in life. It lights the path for us, and we continue with our study of the book of Hebrews and pray that you will inspire what is covered, what is said. We pray you'll open our understanding to glean more from the marvels of what is written here and what you inspired so long ago. So we thank you. We pray for your spirit. We pray that you and Christ will be present with us, and we ask this in Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen. All right, as, as best I remember, we got through um, the book of uh, in Hebrews 11, we got through um, Abraham's, where he came, he went back to and continued with Abraham and kind of his ultimate test where he was told to take the son of promise and go and offer him. And so I think we finished through that part. Um, um, as I've gotten the notes here, our greatest sacrifices involve giving up that which is nearest and dearest. And of course, with uh, Abraham, that was that son that he had waited for so very long. Okay, then as we continue in verse 20, we have three examples that are grouped here in verses 20, 21, and 22. Uh, there is a common denominator that each of these men, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph, each of them are speaking at a time when they are just about to die. So starting in verse 20 with Isaac, by faith, Jake, uh, excuse me, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. <clears throat> now in Genesis 27, verse 2, it's Jacob speaking to Esau when he sent him to go kill some wild game and, you know, prepare a, a meal for him. But in verse two, then he said, behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. So this was at uh, Isaac's, uh, the, toward the end of his life. But if you think of the story of Isaac and Rebekah, they each played favorites. They each had a favorite son. It wasn't the same son. And so there was all this drama behind the scenes and the deceit by which Jacob stole the birthright, or so it appeared. But in reality, behind the scenes, God had rejected Esau and was choosing Jacob to receive the, uh, the, the primary birthright blessing. But when it came down to the end of Isaac's life, and he recognized when Esau came after Jacob had come, you know, with the, uh, the skins on his arms and presented the meal, uh, Isaac thinking that was Esau. Uh, at the end of his life, Isaac recognized by faith there's something here that God is working out. And so at that time, he passed on the blessing, but he had to suppress his own favoritism for Esau in order to give Jacob the predominant birthright blessing. So through faith, he perceived that the will of God was for Jacob to receive the blessings of Abraham. Now in verse 21, by faith, Jacob. So we go to the next generation. When he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. So um, in Genesis 47, verse 29, when the time drew near that Israel must, must die. 
And then that led to the next chapter of the passing on of a blessing to Ephraim Manasseh. And then the next chapter after that, a blessing pronounced on all of the, the 12 sons. But Jacob had made the same mistake that his father had made. He had a favorite son. He had a lot of sons, but his favorite son was Joseph. And God allowed him to go through the, the unbelievable heartache of thinking that this son was dead for so many years. And when it came time to pass blessings along to Joseph's sons, you remember how he crossed his hands and placed the right hand on the head of the younger Ephraim. And he was, as it said, he uses the word wittingly. He was wittingly doing that. And somehow God had revealed something to him, or so it seems to read to me, that uh, the primary dominant blessing will go to the younger son, you know, as far as being the whole company of nations, and a bit of a lesser blessing as far as the single great nation would go to Manasseh. But again, an act of faith, because surely his heart cried out uh, to him to... Uh, uh, as far as the complaint that Joseph made that, Dad, you, you, you shouldn't cross your hands, but he did it anyway. Verse 22, by faith, Joseph, so now we go to another generation. When he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instruction concerning his bones. So down or back in Genesis 50, verse 24, Joseph said to his brothers, I am dying, but God will surely visit you. So these Israelites in Egypt, Joseph is going to die. But he again in faith knew God will bring you out of here and take you to the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's a land that Joseph hadn't seen since he was a teenager. And now he's dying. I think it's, uh, what was, 110, I believe he was when he died. So the bulk of his life was spent in Egypt, which was not the promised land, of course. And God lifted him up to a remarkable position of prominence, prominence in, the, in the government. And God was working that all out, as Joseph told his brothers when he revealed his identity, that, that God did this to save many people. And so when it came time to die, he said, don't leave my remains down here in Egypt. Take them with you to the land of promise. So if you read carefully there in Exodus 13, verse 19, Moses, as they're leaving Egypt after the Passover, as they're leaving, he took the bones of Moses. Uh, excuse me, the bones, Moses took the bones of Joseph. And then if you read at the end of the book of Joshua, Joseph's bones were buried at Shechem, which was in the territory inherited by his descendants. So that's Joshua 24, verse 32. Then we go to verse 23, by faith, Moses. So now we're shifting to Moses, skipping you know, some generations of time. When he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's commands. There are some legends, there are statements Josephus makes that we, you know, they're not scripture, but they are interesting. Apparently, he truly was just a such a beautiful child. Of course, any parent thinks that of their own children but such a beautiful young man that he was just, uh, he, it, was, it was striking to people. Um, here we have, in this case, the parents of Moses who are acting in faith. They make the determination to place him in this ark of bull rushes and push him out into the Nile at a time when, um, you know, all the Hebrew children were being killed. Um, in Moses' case, he faced life with a similar fearlessness that he inherited from his parents. 
And Stephen, of course, in his Apologies, Acts chapter 7, he mentions how Moses was trained in all the knowledge of the Egyptians. If you go to Josephus, he talks about all the training he had, all the education, uh, about his service in the army, being the general leading the armies of Egypt against the Ethiopians. And so he really had, like Joseph, a position of prominence. Now, as we look to verses uh, 24 to 26, it's, I thought it was interesting that James Moffat, uh, Bible translator and commentator, pointed out that the, here's a series of five separate acts of faith connected with Moses's life. The first one, A, is his parents placing him in the ark. Uh, second one, B, would be Moses' loyalty to his own people. He reached a point. The first 40 years was in Egypt, but he reached a point where he recognized at, at what point he realized he's of Hebrew descent. We aren't told. But he chose his own people, and he gave up ultimately all of his earthly glory, all the accolades of man, in order to please God. Uh, again, what, what he knew of God at that time, we don't know, but in looking back um, across his life, we see it later. Uh, thirdly, point C, Moses left Egypt. It says that he didn't fear the king, but he, um, he apparently was beginning down that path of learning to fear God. And he also gave up all of the wealth and the honor of life and took up the role of a shepherd and did that for a second 40 years of his life, patiently waiting on God until the time was right. And then uh, point D, Moses prepared the Israelites. We'll see all of these as we go back to these verses. Uh, for the, This is for saving the firstborn on the Passover. And then E, he led the Israelites through the Red Sea. So going back over to verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, you know, that's, that's as close as we are told, is that age 20? Uh, was it older? Uh, we, uh, we don't know. We're left to wonder. Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So he recognized what had happened at what point he realized this or was told this. We don't know choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing, passing pleasures of sin. Um, they're only temporary. They, they're, you turn around and sin promises all of these pleasures, but they are so quickly gone, and, and then the scars are left behind. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he looked to the reward. Then, verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So we're introduced to Moses mainly in Exodus 3, the event of the, the burning bush, but it seems seems that there had been a, an awareness of God and maybe some type of relationship with God. And then with the events of the burning bush, when he was a young spring chicken of 80, it was time to go to work as God's tool of deliverance. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So he led Israel through that process, the killing of the lambs and, and taking uh, some of the blood of the lambs and putting on the doorposts. And then um, he looked to the reward. By faith, he, okay, uh, verse 28, by faith, he kept the Passover. Okay, I just read that. Verse 29, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. So it was there at the Red Sea, as the Israelites were boxed in, they had the sea, they had the mountains, they had the Israelites, excuse me, the Egyptian army coming up, and they lifted up their eyes and they, they wept. But Moses stood there and said, stand still and see the salvation of God. 
And so he was God's tool to lead them through all of this. And in William Barclay's uh, commentary, I thought it was interesting on this event of walking through the Red Sea. He, he writes, the greatest barrier in the world is no barrier if God is there to help us over it, or in the case of the Red Sea, to help us through it. In verse 30, we shift the focus. Um, the author just, you know, Paul, as we believe it is, he's just running out of time and he can't cover everything. So he's beginning to hurry up the story and to summarize and just, he'll, he'll lead to mentioning a number of names and then he'll, that'll be followed by listing a bunch of events. But in verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, so this is in the days of Joshua. Now, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Now, Rahab, that's interesting that God brings in Rahab. He brings her into the story, but he also brings her into the very lineage of Jesus Christ. Um, if we go to Matthew 1, verse 5, you will notice that she is in the line of Christ. And she, uh, she was the, through Salmon, a Jew, she bore Boaz, who married Ruth, a Midianitis. So two uh, Canaanitis and a Midianitis are, are grafted into the very lineage of Christ. And um, anyhow, she, um, she is mentioned in, by the Apostle James in James 2, verse 25, uh, in that section where he's talking about faith and works. And he said, I'll show you my faith by my works. Well, he mentions Rahab and says that she was justified by the action she took that led to the salvation of the two Israelite spies. In verse 32, and what more shall I say? So he's saying, okay, we, we've covered enough. We're running out of time. For the time would fail to tell me of Gideon. And each one of these stories is a phenomenal story of faith in itself. Gideon, the man who was told, you've got too many. Let the ones that don't want to fight go home. And then he was told, nope, you've got too many. So watch the way they go and, and drink from the stream. 300 warriors with lamp, uh, lamps in their, in their pots and trumpets routed this innumerable number of Midianites. Barak, uh, Barak, of course, Deborah was the one who was encouraging him and pushing him along, but they too you had a, a small number, and you had, um, I forget, who, who was it they were fighting against? I want to say the Philistines. Anyhow, th this great company, great army against them, and, and then the chariots that they had, and the overthrow that was given. Samson, Samson was always a one-man army. And if you can uh, pick up city gates and walk off with them a few miles and, and put them down, then I guess, I guess you only need one. An army of one, always. And whether it was being attacked by a lion or whether it was, um, you know, fighting thousands and killing them with the jawbone of a donkey. And Jephthah, you know, Jephthah was the illegitimate son who later on Israel called him back. You know, come back and lead us. And a great victory was given through his generalship. Uh, David, David just gets passing mention as well, but we know so many stories of David. Sam, uh, Samuel, he was uh, the son of a woman who went to God year after year after year as a barren woman. And finally in her old age, God blessed her with that son of promise. And, and then Samuel, what a remarkable tool he was, standing for God, standing for what was right in the face of an Israel being led by King Saul. And the prophets, so he just mentions, and all the prophets, who through faith 
subdued kingdoms. So probably with each one, there are names that uh, we could put in here. Subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. So with that, we think of Daniel. With that, we could think of young David, who, you know, when the flock was attacked by the bear and the lion, God gave him a victory. 34, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, were made strong. With that one, I always think of King Hezekiah. You know, the historical chapters in the middle of Isaiah, what, Isaiah 38, 9, somewhere right in there. He was told, you're going to die. He was sick, and he was told he was going to die by Isaiah. And yet out of that, he turned, he cried out to God, he asked for 15 years, and God gave it to him. Out of weakness, he was made strong. Became valiant in battle. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Uh, by that, or with that one, I think of uh, Jonathan and, and his armor bearer taking the two swords of Israel going down the escarpment and back up the other one and in a little flat area attack the Philistines and, and they start fighting each other and earthquake and anyhow. Women received their dead raised to life again. You know, both Elijah, Elisha, there were women who were given their sons again. But, you know, right here, right here, we've got a, uh, well, yeah, we, we have a marked change in focus. Because now we start looking at people who were filled with faith, who would have cried out to God as fervently for whatever their trial, trial or obstacle was, but God's answer for them was no at that time. Others were tortured. So if someone was tortured, don't you suppose they'd be crying out? And yet they're listed, they're referred to here uh, without their name being mentioned as, as a, a pillar of faith. Not accepting deliverance. That they might obtain a better resurrection. There's that word better once again that we've seen throughout the book. There is a better resurrection and that's the first resurrection, the resurrection to glory. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. You know, just think of Jeremiah. You know, he was taken, he was put down the well, down, you know, so far up in the muck at the bottom of the well, and they hauled him out, and well, just all kinds of things he went through. Verse 37, they were stoned. They were sawn in two. It is legend. But I think it's worthy to mention that uh, there are a number of sources that mention that Isaiah the prophet, uh, when the wicked king Manasseh came into the, into the kingship, that Isaiah was taken with the idols. He was told you need to support them or else. And then he was uh, cut in half with a great uh, huge wooden saw. Well, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. I like to think of that phrase, of whom the world was not worthy. This chapter began all the way back with righteous Abel. It has come across the ages and is bringing them to the day and age that these Christians lived 2,000 years ago. The annals of the trials and tribulations of the people of God has continued, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, See, the common denominator is they all faced great battles and they endured by faith. Did not receive the promise. None of these received the ultimate promise, which is the kingdom of God and eternal life. 
He did not receive it. They were the trailblazers, though. They went to make the way for us to follow. Verse 40, God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. God's perfect plan involved the foundation and the work of the New Testament church. And the author, we believe is Paul, he's writing to Jewish Christians of the first century. They were among the the early generations of uh, this group of us, something better. The, the earlier crowd will not be made perfect apart from us. There was a need for the coming of Christ, not merely to be the lamb to give his life for the sins of humankind, but also to teach, to train, to select, and to found a church that would do a work and be given a commission that would continue across the ages until the uh, the end of time. Marvelous chapter. Just so many stories and just so many more that could have been mentioned. But all of this is given as a backdrop to what he then returns to in chapter 12. We feed, you see the word therefore, and that denotes an emphatic conclusion to the previous section that all of that was given to lay a foundation for what he's going to tell them, and that is run your race. Don't get tired. Don't sit down on the bench and watch the others go on. Faith works. All of these who went before witnessed to the value and blessing of walking by faith in God. So in verse 1, therefore we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. So, as we have mentioned many times, Paul often goes to this analogy of running a race. But it's not, it's not like a, a sprint, a 100 or 200 meter. It's like a spiritual marathon where you're a race where you run until you reach the finish line, whenever that may be. Let us run with endurance the race, which is, okay, let me back up a little, lay aside every weight. You know, if you're going to go climb uh, um, here in Alaska, I would say if you were going to climb Denali, uh, Mount McKinley, 20,000 plus feet in elevation. If you're going to go to the Himalayas and climb the highest mountains, Everest and K2, you would lay aside every ounce that you did not have to have for that final ascent of the of the summit and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of god so a spiritual marathon, Larry Walker wrote, actually he wrote this, uh, I, can't, I think a sermon summary back at the end of Worldwide Days. Larry Walker, our, you know, a retired pastor down in Oregon. And he's, he's an old runner, marathon man himself. But he wrote uh, the, about the spiritual marathon. But here Paul stresses the importance of laying aside the temptations, the sins that easily trip us up and or weigh us down. Anything that slows us down has to be left alive, left behind. We have to put it out of our life. But Christians are continually in the process of training, seeking to be in the condition that they can complete the race. We were warned by Christ, Luke 21, verses 34 to 36. He said, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down. And then here are some of the weights that can easily pile on. Carousing, drunkenness, and cares of his life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. And then he talks about watching and praying always. You may be kind of worthy to escape. Uh, another one is uh, 1 Corinthians 
1 Corinthians 9, beginning verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And all of you know, except, well, Roy would not know, be aware, but we had the I, Iditarod um, sled dog race, famous race in Alaska, and it just, is it, well, it's still wrapping up. There's some teams still out there, but what is it, uh, approaching 1,100 miles in uh, bitter winter conditions, and, uh, you know, it's just, to me, amazing, the the way the dogs have been bred, they're different. They used to use the big old Huskies and the Huskies would run so far and just lay down. But these dogs they've bred today, they just run and run and run and just keep going. And that's what he's saying here, run in a way you may obtain it. So he talks about uh, running for the imperishable crown. Okay, verse 27, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. But verse 2, we read, keep your eyes on the finish line. Keep your eyes, focus on Jesus Christ. And, you know, in part, we know that the dead know nothing. The dead in Christ are just that, they are dead. But the way he's He's hinging this right on the heels of chapter 11. He's essentially saying we have all of those who have gone before us who have even suffered all the way to death, and they're there cheering us on, uh, wanting us to finish our race. But look to Christ. If we look to people, uh, we'll lose focus. People oftentimes let us down. Jesus is the perfecter of the faith. Okay, in verse 3, for consider him, again speaking of Jesus, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So we come, you know, here, what, Friday, we have a full moon. It's stunning to think about. Next full moon is the first day of unleavened bread, you know, the night to be much observed. We have a month, and we're going to be keeping the Passover. And so as we examine ourselves, as we go back and pour through some of those chapters of the sufferings of Christ, it is always stunning, shocking, and humbling to think of and to focus on what he went through. And um, anyhow, he's saying here, consider that example, one who willingly suffered in obedience to his father. And in verse four, he reminds them, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. But he adds that word yet. We don't know where life will lead any of us. Verse 5, you have forgotten the exhortation to which he speaks to you as sons. And now he is quoting from back in Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. My son did not despise the chastening of the Lord. And the word, the word that is translated chastening is often translated as discipline. You know, as parents, we discipline our children, but that mainly is instructing them teaching them, guiding them. Um, sometimes there's a time for punishment of withholding um, uh, a certain blessing or privilege, but generally it's guiding and training, and God does that with us. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. And here's why, verse 6, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And yes, it just seems like there are things we don't learn until we hurt, or there are things we don't see until we are disciplined or chastened. So we daily, you know, do, do we daily focus on the fact that God has taken us, adopted us as his very children, 
And any parent wants the very best for their children. We love our children, and so we teach them. And yes, we discipline them. We guide them. We show them the way. Um, God does the same with us because he wants us to, to enter his, his very kingdom. Okay, verse, uh, verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? So Paul likens it to the family, the human family, and the guidance that, uh, that parents give to their children. Um, and, and I would say that facing God's correction and discipline should be viewed as being positive. God wants us to be in his kingdom. In verse, um, let's see, okay, verse 8, if you're without chastening, of which all have become partakers, you know, we, we are imperfect. We are sinful. Every one of us is corrected by God. Uh, if we're not receiving that, then you are illegitimate, illegitimate, not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Uh, now, you know, we all had a father. Um, I feel I was very blessed with the father I had. Denise feels the same way about her father. We had wonderful fathers, but we also realized there are so many who had horrible, horrible situations in growing up. But as much as we love and cherish the fathers that we had, they weren't perfect, and nor are we. None of us as parents are perfect. But they, they certainly earned our respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of Spirits and live? For they, the, the human parents, indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he, that's God, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. So that's, uh, that's the bottom line. God is training us so that we may share in his glory. Now, I put in here a little story I thought was, was uh, good to bring in at this point. Uh, Stephen Covey, uh, I've, you know, I've seen the story in a number of places, but uh, Stephen Covey, in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, page 33, uh, quoted a story from a work called Proceedings, uh, a magazine of the Naval Institute. And it uh, stresses the importance of being willing to change our course, make it, making a course correction. And that makes it applicable to us. So the story goes, this was turned in by someone who had been in the Navy. Probably never wanted his name to be known, uh, for that matter. But two battleships assigned to the training squadron had been at sea on maneuvers in heavy weather for several days. Uh, the author says, I was serving on the lead battleship and was on watch on the bridge as night fell. The visibility was poor with patchy fog, so the captain remained on the bridge, keeping an eye on all the activities. Shortly after dark, the lookout on the wing of the bridge reported light bearing on the starboard bow, so off to the right. Is it steady or moving astern, the captain called out. Lookout replied, steady, sir, which meant we were on a dangerous collision course with that ship. The captain then called to the signalman, signal that ship, we are on a collision course, advise you change course 20 degrees. Back came a signal. This is from the other light. Advisable for you to change course 20 degrees. Captain said, again, this is to the signalman, send this message, send, I am a captain, change course 20 degrees. The reply came back, I'm a seaman second class, you had better change course 20 degrees. Well, by this time, the captain of the battleship was furious, and he spat out, send, I am a battleship, change course 20 degrees. Back came the flashing light, I'm a lighthouse. So the man telling the story said, we changed course, which is uh, 
a better part of wisdom. But it's a fascinating story. Many, many things are covered, but, you know, wired deeply within the, the psyche of any one of us is, is this innate resistance to change. We fight against it. You know, early in our Bible study series in chapter two, we looked at uh, Parabreho. Uh, there's, there's another one. I didn't write it down here, but, uh, and, and they are nautical seafaring words. And they stressed how easy it is to miss the entrance to the harbor because we're not paying attention. We're falling asleep. We're just not focused on the objective. And the other word, as far as it's so easy to, to drift away, just easily drift away by failing to keep our eyes on the, the objective. And we can neglect salvation to the point that it slips out of our fingers. But our Heavenly Father doesn't want that to happen to any of us. That's why he teaches, trains us, corrects us. And when needed, he punishes us. But what Paul was saying, stay the course, keep your eyes on the finish line. Because, you know, if, if you're only, if you're out there in open sea and you, you have a, if you're headed to Honolulu, and your course is off by one degree, you go that far, you're going to miss it by hundreds of miles. You have to correct the course, continually be checking and rechecking. So um, the farther off course we are, the harder it is to get back on course. So down to verse, verse 12. Um, Therefore, he keeps you know, going back and hitting the reset because of all this foundation we've just laid. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down. You know, a runner is going to get tired. A runner has this continual battle taking place in their own mind. And uh, the feeble knees make, verse 13, make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the work of the, uh, the Lord. Now, Paul, again, I, I put this in here again about running a race and disciplining his body and bringing it into subjection. But, you know, as I, I like to say, I've mentioned many times, there are two times to be a Christian. The first time is when we feel like it. And the other time is when we don't feel like it. And that's just, that's just the way it is. And I also thought of Rocky Three. You know, pardon me, I've got to have a movie quote every so often. Rocky Three, that's the one where Apollo Creed has come back. He is training Rocky this time to fight Clubber Lang. And they're out there on the beach running. And then one day, Rocky, you know, his head's just not in it. He's losing his focus. They're running on the beach. Uh, on the beach. Apollo's trying to get him to go faster. And Rocky just stops and says, tomorrow, tomorrow. And Ro Apollo said to Rocky, there is no tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. And I think that's, again, good advice for all of us. There are so many times we just get tired. And if we aren't careful, we can lose sight, lose sight of the things that really matter. Verse 14, we read, pursue peace, look to holiness. Uh, verse 15, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and many, and by this many, become defiled. So a root of bitterness. This actually harkens back to Deuteronomy 29 verses 17 and 18. And you saw their abominations and their idols, which were among them wood and stone and silver and gold, so that there may not be among you, man or woman or family or tribe, whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations, 
that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. So God through Moses was warning Israel, don't follow these other gods. Don't look to them. Keep your eyes on the true God. If you do not, there is a grave danger of becoming bitter. And um, I, I remember hearing Mr. Herbert Armstrong a long time ago make a statement that in his, in his experience, very few people who become truly bitter ever come back to the church. It's, um, it's a landmine that we don't want to step on. And then he goes to the example of Esau. Esau, Esau, you know, he was, he was a tough guy. You know, hunter, go out, kill animals, bring them in, cook them for his father. So any root of bitterness, verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. And the marginal note says any godless person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. So we remember that story. And in passing, it was mentioned with, uh, with, Joseph, with Jacob, his brother, earlier. He sold his birthright. He took uh, instant gratification and gave away everything. He later wanted it back. And when his father explained to him, you know, it's already been given to your brother, he cried like a baby. And anyhow, he became so bitter. Uh, Jacob was right to, to fear his brother Esau when he came back uh, many years later. So uh, a person can drift so far away that they disregard the blessings that God holds out for us. And then verse, uh, verse 17, for you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a point of no return. So chapter 11 provided all of these examples of men and women who walk by faith and await as the dead in Christ for the promises. But Esau is one example of one who so disregarded the blessing that he lost out completely. Again, therefore, he keeps using that word, therefore, we are exhorted to zealously follow the examples of those who have faithfully completed their race and go and do likewise. In verse 18, we come to an interesting section here, uh, just a fascinated, fascinating contrast. Uh, the author reminds the New Testament church members, Jewish members, of events long ago when Israel camped at Mount Sinai. Remember how God told them, put barriers, put the fences out there that no one crosses. Uh, don't go up and touch the, ma the mountain. Apparently it rose up so sharply that it was as if you could just walk up and put your hand on the mountain. Make sure no animal, any man or animal who does so, is going to be struck down. And so in verse 18, for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire into blackness and darkness and tempest. So he's going back to the description of the events of Exodus 19 when Israel camped there at Sinai. Verse 19, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the words of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. You know, the Israelites said, uh, you know, Moses, we're scared. You go talk to him. You come back and tell us what he said. Verse 20, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. 21, and so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Now, this actually comes from later on in Deuteronomy 9, where Moses was retelling the story of the uh, trials and tribulations and travels of Israel. 
And he mentioned how exceedingly scared he was at that time. Verse 22, but you, so you, my audience, the Jewish Christians, you have come to Mount Zion. Not Mount Sinai, but again, we have an old covenant that was established there. We have a new covenant that these people had been able to enter as you and I have entered. And to the city of the living God. The, the heavenly Jerusalem. The innumerable company of angels. Okay, the old covenant. There were barriers there ended up with this Levitical system where no one but the high priest could go before God one, one day a year. And now under the new covenant, everyone at any time through the blood of Christ and with the mediating of Jesus Christ can go and approach the Father at any time. To the general assembly. I think I skipped an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Jesus was the first of the first, but then as names are written in the book of life, we are the first, the early crew, the first group who are registered in heaven, in the book of life, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Again, think of this allegorically as as these uh, spirits of those who have gone before us, who have been perfected and are awaiting eternal life in the resurrection. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Well, again, he's comparing and contrasting here. There is a better covenant. And the first one was physical. It was here on the earth. The second one, the one that we enter, is spiritual in heaven, but coming to the earth. Um, okay. Oh, the, you mentioned the, the blood of sprinkling. It speaks better things. You know, the blood of Abel's lamb, or it may have been Abel's blood himself, or his own blood. Uh, the lamb's blood foreshadowed the shedding of the ultimate blood, the blood of the ultimate lamb, Jesus Christ. But uh, Abel's blood, when he was murdered, he was there on the ground. God said he's, his blood's crying out from the ground. And um, Christ's blood, though, was for mercy, for forgiveness, and for the, the promise and the offering of eternal life. Okay, a few more verses here. Uh, verse uh, 25. Verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? So, again, after the comparing and contrasting of the old with the new covenant, he again exhorts us to diligently and carefully listen to and follow God. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised saying, and here he quotes from Haggai 2, verse 6, Haggai 2, verse 6, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. So at Sinai, the voice of God and the sound as of trumpets and all was quaking and shaking them so that they were scared to death. How much, how much more so when God again, as the prophet says, once again, shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Verse 27, now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. And again, remember, we have a transition age here from the time of the death of Christ in 31 AD until the temple was destroyed in 70. There was a functioning holy place at the temple. There was the functioning Levitical um, a tribe with the priests and all the sacrificial system. 
but the book is preparing the Christians that all that you have looked to for your entire history is about to be completely wiped away. And in short order, it was. Things that are, as of things that are made, things that cannot be shaken may remain. Okay, verse 28, therefore, here's again one of those summary statements. Since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, you know, the one that started at Sinai, the tabernacle temple or t tabernacle in the wilderness, wherever it traveled, the temple of Solomon, the reconstruction temple, Herod's temple, all of this is going to be shaken to the point that it's going to disappear. We look to a kingdom where nothing will be shaken. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. So the degree to which we devote our lives and our focus, our attention to the kingdom, to that degree, we cannot be shaken. But even now we are called citizens of the kingdom of God. And uh, Exodus 24, verses 17 and 18, this was after the ratification of the, the covenant with, uh, with Israel, shedding of blood. Uh, verse 17, the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire at the top of the mountains in the eyes of the children of Israel. And so Moses went into the cloud, the midst of the cloud, and went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So an awareness of God's presence, of God's unlimited power, should always be a, a most sobering thing for us. So that, uh, that brings us to the end of chapter 12, and that's where we're going to have to drop it uh, next week. Again, remember, um, tonight was postponed a week because we had company, but uh, the next Bible study will be next Wednesday night. And we'll uh, we'll wrap up the book and um, may may have a little time for uh, something else because we just have chapter thirteen here to to continue. It's uh, what twenty five verses. So 